Our Father, we praise you. We thank you this morning. We thank you because you, out of your love, would send your only begotten Son so that whoever would believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God, I'm so thankful that you demonstrated your love for us in this, that while we are yet sinners, that you would die for us. What a triumphant day it is today, Lord. Our hope rests on what took place on this day. The fact that you raised your son, our Lord Jesus Christ, from the dead. And in so doing, God, you've given us victory over death. Oh, how it is an amazing thing to stand in that victory that you won on the cross for us. And I pray, God, today that you would remind us of the immense the sacrifice that you paid to purchase us that we might be your children. Help us, God, to live in such a way that you would be honored. Lord, as we come to this time of the reading and preaching of your word, I pray that you would remove anything that may distract us. I pray that our minds would be focused upon that which you have to say to us. We've come expectant to hear a word from you. We've come not because we want to just join with other believers, but we've come because we want to be in the presence of the Almighty God. And so I pray that as we progress through the service that you would continue to manifest your presence in a mighty way. I'm so thankful that you have given us this marvelous privilege in the United States to be able to meet freely, read your word and sing your praises to worship you. Oh God, I pray that you would help us to be mindful of this great privilege that we have to gather together on your day, the Lord's day. Now, Lord, as we read your scriptures, as we meditate upon your word, I pray that your Holy Spirit would minister your word to our hearts, God, that you would embrazen upon us that which you would have us learn and that which you would have us do. I pray as we leave here this morning that we would leave here both encouraged, challenged, and equipped to live greater lives for you. We thank you again for your love. And Lord, I pray that you would be honored in this time. And this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Today's the day of the resurrection. And so it's a marvelous day. It's that day that we remember that Jesus was raised from the dead. Why is this an important day? I believe it's a very important day for Christianity for various reasons. The first reason is, let's look at the without the resurrection, what it would look like. Without the resurrection, the death of Christ would have just been a, the death of an, another martyr. Uh, without the resurrection, the death of Christ would really be a very sad story to hear a man that lived a great life, made many promises, and didn't live up to any of them. Without the resurrection, uh, Christianity would be like just any other religion with a dead God. But we know that Christ has been raised from the dead, and therefore we know that our Redeemer lives. We have a, the living Savior that lives today to intercede for us. And he's seated at the right hand of the Father. Without the resurrection, uh, the disciples would not have been able to turn the world upside down uh, for him. For this was the one thing that, that really uh, pushed them and, and pressed them on was their sold outness, if you would, uh, that Christ was not just a dead corpse in a tomb, but that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. When you go through the book of Acts, and I'm going to do that with you very quickly, uh, just for a few chapters, and I'm going to leave the rest for you to do as homework, uh, if you'd like some homework. But I'd like to just take a quick look at why the resurrection was important to uh, the disciples, and specifically to the apostles, when we hear uh, Peter saying uh, things like, 
We don't only believe that he was crucified, but that he was raised from the dead. This teaching of the resurrection is that which both permeated and punctuated the ministry of the disciples in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 2. You'll remember at the time of Pentecost, and as the church is born, we have Peter, the one that denies Christ, standing up. And he, listen to what he says. I read a few passages to you. I've asked the men to put them up because I'm going to run through them very quickly. In Acts chapter 2, this is what Peter says at the time um, of Pentecost. He says, men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you. Through him, as you yourselves know, this man was handed over to you by God's set purpose, foreknowledge, and with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Listen to this. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Just a little bit further, uh, in verse number, verse number 31, uh, we have again in the same sermon of Peter, Peter saying, seeing that was ahead, speaking of David, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of that fact. In chapter number 3, we find Peter and John healing a cripple as they're on their way uh, to go in worship. And the crowd are astonished. And they look to them and say, what's going on here that this man has been healed? So in chapter 3, verses 12 through 15, we find the answer they're going to give. When Peter saw this, he said to the men of Israel, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare as if by our own power of godliness had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant, Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead, and we are witnesses of this. Chapter number four. Now we have the Sanhedrin listening to this teaching that's going on, seeing this man that has been healed. They, they come alongside and say, what are you doing here? Chapter four, verse number eight uh, through to uh, verse number 10. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, now says to them, rulers and elders of the people, if, you're being, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it's by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but God raised from the dead, this man stands before you healed. So now what the Sanhedrin are going to say, you all need to be quiet. Stop speaking in the name of this Jesus. You all need to be quiet immediately. Well, the response that is given by Peter in chapter 5, verse 29 through verse 31 says this. Peter and the other apostles reply, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead whom you've killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him to his own right hand as a prince and savior that he might give repentance and forgiveness of sin to Israel. Verse 32, we are witnesses of these things and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Every time they're challenged, every time they, they're proclaiming the gospel, they're not proclaiming just a gospel of a savior that was crucified. They're not just speaking of one that died, but they are saying this, we are completely sold out on this fact that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. And that is why these apostles would die for their belief. They knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that that which Christ had claimed about himself, that he was the Savior, he was the Messiah, the Christ, that this was true, and it was proved by the resurrection. You see, without the resurrection, Christianity would truly be 
purposeless, useless, and completely impotent. However, with the resurrection, we understand that the resurrection authenticated who Christ Jesus is. It's one thing to say that you are the son of God. It's one thing to say you've been sent to seek and to save the lost, but it's something totally different to prove it by dying and being raised from the dead. You see, just the fact of the resurrection leaves people with a great question. Either Christ's claims of being the Messiah, the Christ, the only Son of God, the only way to salvation. Remember he said that, did he not? I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. When we look at the resurrection, here is the question that is then posed to all of humanity. Either Jesus Christ is an absolute liar, or he's an absolute lunatic, or his Lord. He leaves no neutral ground because of his claims. And so the resurrection authenticates those claims of Christ. It validates the perfection of his death. It is the resurrection that proves that Jesus Christ has triumphed over death. And that's why he can say, I am the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in me shall have life. It is the resurrection that also shows that the Father was pleased, that Christ truly was the propitiation for our sin. But before we can get to this resurrection, we have to go by way of the cross. And I think we would be amiss this morning if I only had to speak on the resurrection without explaining a little bit about the cross And I don't think there's any better way than doing that by going to the cross. So I'm going to do that this morning just uh, by means of of, um, a testimony, uh, sharing with you what took place to the point of the cross. And then we're going to go to the book of John, and we're going to meet with the Christ on the cross. You good with that? If not, you're in trouble. You're good, good. So this is the way it goes. Uh, We know that Jesus Christ was born uh, to a virgin uh, in Bethlehem, just as was foretold by the prophets thousands of years before his coming. And we know that he would grow in wisdom and in stature. And we know that this Christ who was born into this world was uh, as old as his heavenly father, but yet older than his mother. Uh, He was... Uh, the infant that stepped out of eternity. We understand that he was the baby that was born to die. And all the way through his life, I believe, he knew his destiny. For he continually would teach his disciples, the Father has sent me to seek and to save that which is lost. Christ knew his destiny. His destiny was to die. And so as we find Christ growing in wisdom and stature, eventually we find him uh, at the Jordan River. And right at that river, we will hear John the Baptist say a, a remarkable statement when he would say, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And Christ is baptized. And at this point, he enters into uh, his public ministry. Throughout his public ministry, you're going to find him coming across many struggles with the Sadducees, with many struggles with the Pharisees, and it would be this great struggle, almost a power struggle for them. But Christ came to abolish that. He came so that he would die on the cross to make atonement for our sin, that whoever would believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And so let us fast forward, if you would, to the time of the betrayal of Christ. And so we find him in the upper room, and it's there that he's enjoying the the Passover with his disciples. And at the Passover, he identifies Judas as the one that will betray him. And from there, he would go across the Kidron Valley and up into the Mount of Olives, and there in the Garden of Gethsemane, we find our Lord saying to his disciples, watch and pray, but they all fall asleep. And he continually goes back and forth and they fall asleep. And everyone is kind of just not supportive as as our Christ is in this garden and, and crying out to the Lord in much agony. In fact, the scripture says that he was sweating blood from his brow. 
as he was in anguish awaiting that which would come. And then we find this man, Judas, walking in with the temple guard and the soldiers, and he kisses Christ. And he says, this is the one. Can you imagine the betrayal, the suffering that came with that? You see, the suffering of the Christ is more than just what happened on the cross. The suffering of the Christ took place way before that. Can you imagine the anguish of his soul? And so he is now arrested and taken down and is brought before Annas, uh, the, the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest, and he's there, he is there, uh, uh, have a mock trial done. And then he's taken from there to Caiaphas, the, the high priest, and there they have a trial against him and there's uh, much false witness brought against him and he is beat against the face for lying while speaking truth. And from there he's taken to Pilate and Pilate is told to crucify him. Those same voices that uh, at the time of the triumphal entry that were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, meaning save us, deliver us, and now are going to change to voices saying, crucify him, crucify him. And there's an opportunity given to let him go. And Barabbas is standing there, a murderer, a thief. And they say, we can give you Barabbas or, or we can hand you Jesus. And they said, let Barabbas go free. Crucify Jesus. And so the soldiers will take the Christ, our Lord Jesus. And they would fashion a crown of thorns and place it upon his head. They beat him with a stick. They fell on the ground before him, giving mock homage to this king of the Jews. They would spit on him. They would curse him. They would put a purple robe upon him, saying, you the king of the Jews? And then they would take him out and they would tie him to a whipping post. And there they would beat him. In fact, the scripture says in Isaiah that they ripped the beard from his face. That that which was left did not look even human. This is the suffering of the Savior. And as they're leading him out, the people are standing down the sides of the Via Della Rosa all the way up Mount Calvary. And they're saying, you're the Christ, save yourself. King of the Jews, save yourself. They lay him on the cross. And there they would pierce his hands and his feet with nails. And they would raise him up. And I can imagine the Christ looking down. The scripture says that his mother and Mary Magdalene of the other woman and the apostle John was right there and they could see him. And I can imagine the anguish. Bad enough for the people to call out at him and say, save yourself. But even those that were guilty hanging on the two crosses alongside of him, those, those thieves, the one would say, if you're the Christ, save yourself and save us too. But the other thief would say, don't you fear God, for we are guilty. And then he would say to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So as we are now on the cross, we hear the voice of Jesus speaking. John chapter number 19 And I want to read to you from verse 28. Now later, knowing that all was now complete, and so that the scriptures would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. 
a wine, of, a, a, a wine vinegar was there, so they soaked the sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. And when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. What an amazing statement for Christ to make. That passage started out with saying, and later, seeing that all had been fulfilled according to the Scriptures. And then we find Christ's final words, and these are his words, it is finished. For some, this word may be a word of, a a cry of some worn out martyr. No, no, no. This cry, tetelestai, it is finished was a cry of victory. It was that victory cry. It's done. It's complete. And notice his spirit was not taken from him, but he bowed his head and he gave it up. You see, no one takes his life from him. He says he lays it down and takes it up when he wants to. And so we find that Christ says, it is finished, it's complete. Tetelestai is the the, the term that is used here. It is a victory cry, a declaration from the Savior that it is accomplished. The price has been paid. Victory is at hand. All that was necessary still to happen was the resurrection of the Christ to validate everything that he had said and had promised. So the question then is, what is finished? What is finished? Well, there's numerous things. Uh, One of the things that were finished is he had completed all the prophecies with regard to his birth, life, death, and wood resurrection. Isn't that an amazing thought? That this is not some normal man? Uh, We can try to change things in our lives to try and make them line up. With, with what we uh, would want to see as prophecy. But the Christ was born in the correct line, into the right family, at the right time, into the, from a, a virgin, in the right town. And everything in his life lined up with the prophecies with regard to who he was. You see, other than the resurrection, all the prophecies that were to be completed were completed literally by the Lord Jesus Christ. Proving what? That he is the Savior. That's a great question to ask, by the way. What was he proving? What did it prove? Well, it proved that this is no other martyr. This is not just a good man. This is not just a good teacher. This is not just a good moral example to follow. He didn't claim to be any of those things, even though he may have been. I'm saying to you this, Jesus Christ claimed to be God incarnate. We cannot have him just as a good teacher or a good example without knowing that he claimed to be the Savior. It is finished also speaks to the end of his suffering. As I've tried to illustrate this morning, the suffering of the Christ is more than just what we have viewed on the cross. But can you imagine living your life knowing what your destiny is? Knowing exactly how it's going to take place? It's an amazing thought how he would suffer. His hour, the lifting up of the sun, uh, the time in Gethsemane, the time when even those closest to him, the disciples, would run and flee and leave him. The suffering was great. It is finished. Also says that the goal that he came for was complete. You see, Christ came to be our redeemer. Did you get that? Jesus came to be our redeemer. He came to be the one that would purchase us. This is what Peter spoke about when Peter said that we have not been purchased with perishable things such as silver or gold, but we have been purchased with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God without blemish or defect. That's why he came. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. John 3, 16. Many of you would know that scripture. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, 
that whoever would believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. He didn't send his son to be a great example of how to live, although he is a great example, or to be a great teacher, although he is a great teacher. He sent him to save us, to redeem us, to buy us, to purchase us. I get this picture in my mind when I think of Christ purchasing us. Uh, It's that picture of a slave market. Uh, I'm, I'm thankful we don't have slave markets in the United States, but there's this picture of a slave market where slaves are, are tied to a, to a pole and the master that wants to purchase the slave would walk between these slaves and look at them and, and kind of check in their teeth and make sure their teeth are good and, and just make sure that they're, they're a fine specimen before purchasing them. But you know, the day when Jesus went to the slave market of sin, he saw you and me tied to that cross. And he didn't see one with good teeth or good physique or good works or worthiness to purchase. No, no, he saw that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He saw the filth of our sin. And he said, I want that one. And so the price was set. Not one dollar, not a million dollars, not the price of a good life, a good moral acting, none of that. The price was set. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. And so here's the price. You want that one, Jesus? Pay his price. It's gonna cost you your life. And what did he say? Uh, I don't think I want that one anymore. No, no, no. He willingly went to the cross and paid the full price as he would drink full strength from the cup of the wrath of God on the cross. For what purpose? Well, to demonstrate his love for us that while we were yet sinners that he would die for us. It is finished also speaks of the accomplishment of the atonement. Is it not that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin? Isn't that what the Bible teaches in the book of Hebrews? Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. The wages of sin is death. Death has to be be paid. Well, Christ has been our sacrifice. He paid the price in full. And therefore he says, it's finished. No more to be paid. Completely Paid just for you. No more good works to do and nothing to try and keep your salvation, but born again in an instant because Christ paid the full price on the cross. Born into the family of God, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, now compelled to live for Christ. Before slaves to sin, now slaves to righteousness. In an instant, new creatures, The old is gone, the new has come. A.W. Pink said it this way, Upon a life I did not live, upon a death I did not die. Another's death, another's life, I cast my soul eternally. Bold shall I stand in that great day, for who ought to my charge can lay? I'm fully absolved by Christ for sin's tremendous curse. And blame. The atonement has been paid for. But it also marks the end of sin for us. Sin no longer has power in our lives. We can live victorious lives for Christ Jesus. Don't misunderstand me now. I'm not saying that people who have come to Christ don't slip into sin. But listen, they don't live to sin. Uh, they, They have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ and the fruit of that is the fruit of repentance. They've turned away. They've turned to Christ. They're sold out on Christ. But unfortunately, they still have presence of sin that they deal with. But praise God, they no longer have the power of sin. They can live a life victoriously. Lastly, and I'll leave you with this thought. It is finished, says Death has no hold 
on you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 57 through 58, speaks of the idea of the sting of death. And listen what it says, but thanks be to God, we have the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brother, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, for you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. You see, it all because of the cross. But that cross would be worthless if not validated, authenticated by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so as we come to the Lord's table this morning, I want to invite you to remember that Easter is not about the Easter bunny. Easter is all about Jesus Christ, that he was a baby born to die, that he paid the full price for your sin on the cross. And he died for them that they should no longer live for themselves, but to live for him who died for them. I pray as you come to the Lord's table this morning that you will remember that salvation is granted for free for it's by grace that we've been saved through faith and this is not of yourself, it's a gift of God lest any man should boast. But because it's free does not mean that it did not come with a great price. Our salvation came with a price that the Father would send his only son. It came with a price of the great suffering that I've spoken about. But boy, it is wonderful to know that he has risen. It's victory. And we look forward to that day when we will see him again. We will see him. What a wonderful day that's gonna be. So our Father, we, we just thank you so much for who you are. We thank you for the truth of your word and we pray God that as we've come today to worship you I pray that you have been honored I pray that your son has been exalted I pray Lord that we can leave this place knowing that we've met with you most of all we thank you this morning for the sacrifice that was made but Lord I praise and thank you for the hope that you've given us the hope we have in your son that he has conquered death and so today we live in his victory. Lord, as we leave this place, we ask your hand upon each one for many that have traveled many miles to be here today. We ask that you would grant them journeys mercies. We pray for those many in our number that are on the roads this weekend and Lord, as they travel back home again, we ask that you would keep them safe and return them to us refreshed and ready to serve you. Father, finally this morning, we lift up those within our community that have not heard this gospel that we have been so privileged to hear, this gospel that we've been so privileged to appropriate. Lord, would you use us, Lakeland Baptist Church, to be the proclaimers of the cross of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that many would come into a saving relationship with you because of the ministry of this church. We're thankful, Lord, that you have appointed each one in this church as a, a herald, each one in this church as a, a messenger of the cross. And so I pray, God, that you would continue to use us. We don't want to play games. We want to be used for your kingdom. Thank you for what you're already doing here. May you be honored in it all. So now we love you. And we thank you for this time we've been able to get together and honor you, Jesus. And this we pray in your mighty name. Amen.